Tim's fun little game. They're like, we moved yeah. it. <laughs> I know. Find it's, it. Well, when you're sharing, of course, all bets are off. You know, it's just like, anyway. Um, Could be anywhere. That's right. Welcome, everyone, uh, to Tech Talk. Uh, what is it? March 24th here in the United States. We have someone on the call from New Zealand. So it's March 25th there. Living in the future is Tanya. Um, super excited to, uh, to have uh, my good friend, Jason. Um, we go way back 10 or 11 years, maybe more than that, something like that. Um, so it's really fun to have him here to uh, talk to us about uh, transitioning into engineering management. So um, I have a slide up here, just a little title slide. Uh, we are gonna, re we're recording this. So um, if you prefer, you, you know, you're welcome to stay you know, face muted so you, um, you know, show up. Um, we have live captions enabled, so you can hit that closed caption button in Zoom and, and get um, automated live captions, which are sometimes pretty funny to read, actually, because uh, they're not always perfect. Um, we, uh, like with everything we do here at the Collab Lab, uh, we have a code of conduct that uh, sort of covers um, just making sure that we are, are good people to each other. Um, so uh, if you haven't read that before, if you haven't been to one of these, please do read that. And then, um, you know, if you're feeling generous, uh, maybe you already have that sweet manager job, <coughs> Jason, you could, you know, just make a little donation to the Collab Lab. <laughs> we are a nonprofit um, that helps early career developers uh, get their foothold in tech and especially people from under underrepresented groups. So we do that through offering project practice where uh, developers come in and they get to sort of just do all the things that uh, software teams do. Um, they pair program, they submit PRs, they code, do code reviews, uh, they demo their work and they participate in retrospectives and just kind of all the things that, that software teams do. So um, anyway, uh, I will introduce Jason and then turn it over to you. I'm gonna stop sharing for this part. But uh, yeah, Jason Phillips uh, is a currently, currently senior engineering manager at Coursera um, for their learning learner core platform. He, um, he's held a bunch of jobs over the years. It's one of those things when you've been in the industry long enough, you can go back and look and find out that Jason was a production assistant for the United States Tennis Association, which we were talking about some stories about that before uh, we all got on. Um, he's also worked, we worked together at Apple for a little while and uh, he was a Pandora and um, Coinbase and then has done a bunch of teaching of uh, kind of boot camps and different things. So um, he's been a mentor here at Collab Lab. So um, yeah, with that, uh, I'm excited to hear what you have to say, Jason. So see if I did this the right way on my own transition to engineering management. Well, thank you, Andrew. And you know, uh, before I jump in and share the slides, I will say there is an experience that happened while we worked together that's gonna come up here that I think you actually were part of the inspiration for. Oh no. How I figured out <laughs> Well, how you can try and compass different management styles. Um, okay. And just for the record, uh, Andrew and I's friendship goes back to a little bit of nerd cred in that I'm pretty sure we both are like sub 100,000 ID users on Twitter because we were on Twitter like not even months after they launched. <laughs> yeah, that's probably <laughs> and right. And that beget this entirely wonderful journey. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to do like we are used to at the office and announce that I'm going to share my screen while sharing it. <laughs> I'm still trying to figure out the psychology then, of why we do that. And then you're going to ask, can you see my slides? See? And then people are going to have to unmute. You know how this works, right? <laughs> yeah. So slides all visible? Yep, cool, yep. Cool, looks cool. good. Uh, so yeah, let's jump right in. Um, so tell us, talk is, so you want to be an engineering manager. And I want this to be a conversation for us to talk about. Uh, nothing definitive, but more so uh, showing through examples and experiences, some of the different ways that I was able to build my path to management, even when I was sure I didn't want to be a manager. Um, that actual switch happened for me at least a decade into my career. Uh, if you'd have asked me in the first 10 years of my career, just leave me in a corner with a bowl of cereal and a couple of cool homies and I can build you the world. That's just what I, what I felt. So, Introduce what we're going to talk about today. I'll do a brief introduction, expand a little bit on what Andrew mentioned about myself. Uh, we'll define what engineering management is. Um, again, this is not meant to be definitive. I think we can all kind of internalize what management actually means to us in practice. But I think there are some general 
principles as to what it means to be a people manager in engineering in particular. Then we'll actually talk about my journey to management, um, take note of a couple of things, and then talk about those a bit more in depth when we talk about how you can take opportunities for growing into management at the workplace before you become a manager. After that, we'll also expand on mentorship opportunities, coaching, and other ways you can continuously learn and grow. And then we'll do what we call the wrap up, where we'll just kind of not put a nice, a nice you know, tight little bow on things because this is just a start, right? Um, being a manager is a lifelong journey. Once you become a manager, you could also become an IC again. You can become a director, a leader, do whatever you want, right? But the goal here is that we kind of have enough information for us to take the next steps in our journey. So with that, I say hello. I am Jason J. Phillips. This is my favorite picture on earth. I took it while at Pandora. I've probably used it ever since. I'm not even sure I have the full rights to it. So Andrew, I'm sorry. I never checked those <laughs> that, that paperwork from Pandora. But currently I am listing engineering manager of the learner platform team at Coursera. Um, we service all of our uh, B2C learners, um, anything from course home to getting a certificate for your course when you complete your program. Um, I've been in software for roughly 19 years now. I've worked at all sorts of companies, three person startups, five person startups, Apple, which probably is like one of the largest companies I've ever been at and everything in between. Uh, I just wrapped up my sixth, my, yeah, my sixth cohort as a web development instructor of boot camps. Um, and I've also taught two boot camps for data visualization. I am mentored TCL6 here at Co uh, Collab Lab. I'm also a multi-year member with Code 2040 and also a mentor coach. Um, currently, um, and we'll talk about this a bit more when we talk about continuous learning, I am a member of Dev Color, which is peer and uh, group level mentorship, as well as uh, currently a leadership fellow with Ceiling Breakers, which aims to uh, prepare leaders of tomorrow for management uh, in underserved communities. Uh, I did not finish my college degree. So I do jokingly say that I graduated from the University of Barnes and Noble. Maybe that'll turn into a sponsorship one day. That would be great. Um, but my journey was all about Barnes and Noble and books. Go in there, take 10 on payday, find the three that spoke to me most, put those aside, read the other seven for free until they were closing down, then bought the three and took those home. Um, you'll notice that you don't see any of those books behind me. And we're going to talk about that. Um, and I am currently in the barrier, originally from New York. And among other things, I'm also a member of the Media Developer Experts Program with Cloudinary. So uh, I do extend that as a different form of teaching as well. But in addition, I also like sneakers a lot. I started collecting again in 2015. Uh, I think sneakers, uh, especially with a couple of friends of mine, uh, we, we really talk about how sneakers tell a different side of your story. So a lot of sneakers I buy aren't just like the super greatest sneakers that everyone wants. Some of them probably aren't even worth $5, but to me, they kind of show a different aspect of my personality. I also play video games every chance I get. Um, fortunately, you know, that aforementioned manager salary that Andrew so eloquently <laughs> referred to, I do have a PlayStation 5 and Xbox. Those are two of my favorite things. Um, but I think it's important that we also introduce ourselves with some of our passions and our likes because these all actually factor into who we are as managers. So, Let's actually jump in and just talk about what is engineering management. Well, this is the Wikipedia definition. I'm going to turn on my stuffy voice, if you will. <clears throat> engineering management is the application of the practice of management to the practice of engineering. Engineering management is a career that brings together the technological problem solving ability of engineering and the organizational, administrative, and planning abilities of management in order to oversee the operational performance of complex engineering driven enterprises. What? I've been a manager for at least six years now that it still didn't make sense to me. So here's a, a nicer form. I believe that engineering management is really about a person who sits at the cross section of people development and product delivery. Both of those aspects are very complex because they involve multiple parts. But an engineering manager typically is accountable for the growth and development of the engineers on their team as well as ensuring that the products and value that their team delivers is successful and meets the goals of the organization. So you will have to have some skill and some share of ability in technical execution, project management, team development, and product development. You don't have to be a master of all. 
you will probably have to go deep in one and be more of a T-shape, broad knowledge, deep in one area. But these four areas really will help you define who you are as a manager. So let's dive into that a bit more. So we talk about those four areas. These are a lot of the qualities, skills, and attributes that may come up. Um, some of them may seem obvious, right? Communication, uh, empathy, uh, emotional intelligence. These are things that we've been focused on a lot, especially in recent years. Uh, technical ability, research. But maybe there are some that aren't always as clear cut, right? Like advocacy. Some people don't really understand how much advocating for your team is important to being the manager. Uh, mentorship and guidance. Um, influence. It's not about being manipulative, but it is about, you know, if you have an idea that you think will deliver value, you have to be able to convince others that your path can lead to the right thing. Uh, I'm not going to probably run, you know, talk through every single word on the slides, but if you, if there's anything I want me to revisit, please feel free to let me know in the chat. Oh, that was just like Twitch. So here's what I think we can call the manager's quadrant, right? Um, and your kind of blend and style of manager will come from your mix of these four areas. Uh, you have the technical, where sometimes you can be a technical lead as a manager and actually still be on a code path of writing code. So there's code quality, direction, you're probably uh, advising on strategy, removing roadblocks from your team. Uh, there's the product part, you know, kind of what to build, why we build it, how we build it, how do we know we're successful, removing roadblocks. And then the people and team aspect, uh, you know, how does someone get to level three to level four? How does Stacy figure out if she wants to be a manager and have opportunities to get there? Uh, how does Andrew prepare to be a director and grow from there? Also removing roadblocks. And then also process, um, you know, bug triage flow. How do we respond to incidents when servers go down? Um, how do, what is our interview process and how do we make it more equitable? And also removing roadblocks. Removing roadblocks will always be the one theme throughout your entire management career that's never actually explicitly said removing roadblocks. But that is one of the most important things that we focus on in any of these areas is ensuring that we keep an efficient flow for people to be who they want to be, um, deliver what we need to deliver, and ultimately be successful. Um, wait, there we go. So because I had a few slides of text, this picture is about nothing except one of my favorite places on earth, the road to Hana. Uh, went there last year around this time with my partner. It was amazing. I wanted to stay. I want to go back. I missed the banana bread. Um, you also notice that on all these slides, I did list all the credits for all the folks on Unsplash who take these photos. So when we make the slides available, please go check out their work. Super amazing photos from everyone. And now back into our program. So one of the most important aspects and things that we can do to prepare to be a manager is to find our why. And this is the part where I'll first reference kind of how looking at Andrew and others, both on a positive and negative side um, from all the influences helped me to understand why I wanted to be a manager. Um, so these are questions that I, I've typically asked myself and I do over and over again, you know, what is my motivation? Um, is it about me being the star? Is it about me letting the team shine? Am I belittling myself? Am I pumping myself up too, too high? Um, which managers left an impression on me? And how does that actually influence my decision? Um, am I happy not writing code on a critical path? The answer is yes, for me. Let me just put that clear. Um, nothing I do when I write code will break anything in production. I am happy about that. I left that stress behind. <laughs> um, you know, do you think that management will actually fulfill you once you get there? And that's a, these are some tough questions to ask, but they are important for us to understand who we want to be and how we want to be there. Um, also, context switching. If you do not like context switching, I will strongly recommend you probably think about being on the more technical aspect. One of the, remember, if I go back a few slides, the one common theme was removing roadblocks. They all have different contexts. <laughs> one second it's a hiring challenge, one second it's, it's something went down, there's a crisis, someone needs help. You're gonna context switch a lot. It's just a thing. So, then we can dive in a bit more on fulfillment. And I really think these are some questions that we should all take home with us. Um, and these are questions I ask myself every year, actually. Um, when's the last time I felt fulfilled working with others, um, either on my team or with other people? Uh, what was my role at the time? What challenges did I help solve? Um, think about like where my strength showed up and also where did my areas for improvement show up, right? How did they show up? How did I actually embrace them? 
right? If my strengths showed up, did I overly egotistically celebrate myself? Also, when my areas for improvement showed up, did I treat myself with grace and give myself the space to grow? Or were I on the negative sides of both of those things? Also, how do you feel about context switching? Notice the theme here. <laughs> like I said, we should revisit these questions often. Um, these are questions that can help make sure that we're checking in with ourselves. And at first and foremost, even in a career of management where you're pretty much in service, in service to others, that you're still taking care of yourself. The one thing they always tell us on the airplane is you have to put on your oxygen mask before you can put on others. Let these questions be your oxygen mask. With that, uh, we will take a little peek at my journey to management. So I've started lovingly calling these the New York years um, because I was in New York, but it wasn't like I moved to New York for college. Anything. I'm, I'm from New York originally, I'm from the Bronx. Um, I had to tell y'all, well, I didn't have to, but it's part of my introduction, but I usually will tell you I'm from New York without you ever even actually having to know. Um, so that's one fun fact about me. We could be talking about, hey, did you get that new such and such video game? Yeah, I'm from the Bronx. It's a thing. But the New York years were kind of where I started to really jump into uh, engineering. Uh, so I had the first lofty title of assistant webmaster. Couldn't tell me nothing. I was great. I had arrived. Um, I also figured out that I liked programming after dropping computer science. Go figure. Um, production assistant at the USDA. Uh, looked up and officially my title was production assistant new media at the US Census Association. What does that even mean? I did a bunch of flash and a bunch of design. I created broadcast assets. I wrote a lot of action script. I knew not how to do nothing but create assets when I got there and write HTML. Uh, then jumped into the lofty world of web development and spent the, and then after I spent five years at uh, an ad agency where uh, the last role I had there was as an engineer in our product engineering group. And then moved into ed tech and worked as a full stack software engineer while uh, flying out to California to interview at companies that Andrew was so gracious to uh, refer me to for employment <laughs> until I landed one at Apple. And that takes us to the Bay Area years. Um, shout out to the California Street uh, rail car, which literally goes 10 blocks. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's the shortest uh, rail car in all of San Francisco, but it's also pretty nice. Um, and actually, that might not, not as the other one. This is the longer one. Ah, it happens. But let's jump back in and focus, Jason. Uh, I was application interface engineer when I first joined Apple. And my first project as an interface engineer was to write back in Scala code. That's why I love being a full stack engineer. <laughs> uh, from there, I was a senior software engineer. That's when I went to Pandora. I really got to cut my teeth on a lot of different types of distributed services. And then I moved into ed tech again. And after teaching my first cohort, became a senior software manager. I made it. I got the title. And then I got my first lesson in management, which is you're always learning about how to be a better manager. Uh, from there, I went uh, into crypto for a bit, was a risk engineering manager, and then also helped build up their growth uh, engineering practice before I went and became a director of engineering. Whoa, I super made it. That was my second lesson that titles are not the same everywhere. And that a director in that organization was a manager everywhere else, which is fine. It's not like it was a step back. The scope was also increased. I also went back to my old job for new team. Uh, and then I got to where I am now, where I am a senior engineering manager overseeing some platform teams. Now, did you notice anything on those two slides? Lot of different roles. You went back and forth though, right? Is that, is that what? No, 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 no. There's one on this slide too. It's an asterisk. So that's cute, right? I hit asterisk on y'all. What does that even mean? Glad you asked. These are the places I actually built managerial skills as an individual contributor. Uh, so the first role was as an UI engineer doing product engineering. And we'll talk about that first uh, area where I built up my agile and product leadership experience. Then we'll talk about my Apple team, where I built up my tech leadership, my team leadership, and also oversaw contract hiring. I wasn't supposed to, but that's a whole other story. We're not going to talk about that. <sighs> and then we'll talk about my role as a senior software engineer when I was at Pandora, where I really got to flesh out and hone in on 
my next steps and being more intentional about becoming a manager. So we'll come back to the bits of information in that, in that slide in a bit. But for now, I guess that bit is now. I forgot to take that slide out. Sorry. Uh, so we're going to talk about now opportunities in the workplace, right? What each of these jobs talk to is how I play. I, what we're going to talk to is how I got to play a different role that gave me an opportunity to build uh, some capacity that we saw we need in our manager quadrant. So those three areas in particular will be the project role, the team lead role, and then company initiatives and groups. The project lead role, aka where there's space to step and partner to ensure delivery, aka what to do when you don't have a project manager or a product, product manager and your team starts to ship a product with a vision. It happens a lot more than you think. So I like to think of my actual experiences as scenarios, right? Um, I want us to be able to take different things from experiences that we talk about, not take them verbatim. Um, so I'll present you the opportunity. Uh, the team was a team of two. There was a VP and then there was me. Uh, we had to focus on building and launching a new client extranet that needed the support. Um, our top 30 clients, which represented some untold millions of dollars in revenue in at least 30,000 users uh, from scratch, by the way, like we didn't, I mean, I don't even think Basecamp, Basecamp might have barely launched by then. Uh, and the opportunity that I, I walked into was we had a reorganization. And in that reorganization, all of our product and business analysts were moved into newer groups that had more priority needs, which meant it was just my VP of engineering and me. Two person team doing whatever they want, but have to figure out how to do it with the process. And so this gave me a lot of space to learn how to one, get more comfortable with the scrum process, two, grow my, my relationship with stakeholders. No longer could I tell my boss, oh, I don't want to do that. We just, you should just tell them no, because he's not talking to the stakeholders anymore. I am. And now they're just not someone asking for something. They're my partner to deliver success. Um, product development. I had to have a vision for this extranet, right? It wasn't just going to be something where you upload files and yay, we're done. We had to talk about the UX. We had to talk about improvements. We had to talk about the roadmap. And cross-functional delivery. I had to work with other product teams where we built you know, all sorts of things like Shared, uh, we, we, built, we built our own implementation of single sign-on and shared key authentication. I don't recommend you do that. OAuth is beautiful. So our uh, CAS servers and other types use open standards. Um, I also, like I said, built up my Scrum leadership skills and also got the ability to lead a cross-functional weekly uh, group where we actually uh, kind of read books and, and studied on how to become better agile managers. Uh, we created a lot of uh, product that had high leverage across client teams. Like I said, we had one major client that had over 20,000 users uh, consuming somewhere around 40 to 60,000 reports monthly from this little system that could. And though the next move, uh, promotion actually moved me back into a pure engineering role, I did have a lot of cross-functional relationships with stakeholders and also creative teams, brand teams, UI teams, that it gave me a boost for success because where others saw conflict, I saw paths for us to talk, right? Where someone said, hey, they're asking for something. I don't think we can do it in two weeks. I said, well, hey, how about we deliver this in two weeks and we do it iteratively, right? I, I was able to build the connections and the leadership acumen to be able to say, I don't wanna say no. I wanna say, when can we say yes? And that's an important skill as you become a manager. You'll know, you'll figure out when to say no. But you'll figure out there's definitely times where you have to say not right now and not no outright. And so yeah, this experience was very valuable. Um, it actually gave me a ton of experience that led me to my next role where I jumped into an ed tech startup where I was employee number 70, which meant I had to design some processes from scratch. Like there's all sorts of little things that weren't done, you know, like it was all hats, all hands on deck. And we had a lot of fun doing it. But that experience taught me how to kind of make process out of chaos or work with my manager and work with other leaders to make that process or help improve it out of chaos. It also helped me define my why, uh, talking about the challenges of product development and why the end user matters when I, wanted to, when I figured out I wanted to be a manager. So we didn't drop a picture in yet. So sorry, you're gonna have a few more pictures of text, oh, few more walls of text, but 
hopefully my soothing voice will keep you entertained. Uh, the next opportunity we're gonna talk about is the engineering team lead role. Um, and this is one that gets a little interesting because team leads in some places are actually managers. So some, in some places, if you get this opportunity to become a team lead, you're actually getting legit management experience. Um, and the interesting thing about the opportunity is there's opportunity to lead the team through different means. It doesn't always mean that you're responsible for someone reporting. It doesn't mean that you're always the most technically sharp one in the room. It doesn't mean you're the one that goes to every meeting, but it does give you some interesting interfaces for growth. So take this scenario. Let's say you work at a company that, uh, you know, it's five letters long, Apple. Um, I don't even know why I'm trying to be coy about it. Uh, so when I was at Apple, uh, my team, uh, which was actually a sibling team that was in support in part to uh, Andrew and other teams, uh, was a director, one manager, two informal team leads, one of which was me. We had about eight to 10 full-time engineers, depending on which season it was, and three contractors. And the focal point that I took being an informal team lead was one, improve team morale. There was a lot of thrash. We were in a very high paced, five million projects environment. The, some of the awesome challenges that exist at Apple also sometimes aren't that awesome in terms of there are projects that people work on that by need, other people don't know about, but you are all still on the same team. So that gives you a very quick lesson on how to build team engagement, even though you're not all in the same room, right? There's also the technical efficiency part. Even though we're all working on different things, we're still using the same tools. We have to be able to make that process better. And in contractor hiring and onboarding, uh, again, I probably wasn't 100% supposed to be owning this, but when you have a system where you can log in as your manager and don't need his password to do it, you can do anything if your team needs it. I'm not going to mention your name on camera. Sorry, but you know, it's my story. It's your story too. Hey, it is what it is. No, I'm not talking to Andrew. I'm talking to my old boss. <laughs> but the opportunity here was a lot of focus areas, right? Um, the engineering manager here, also to be fair to him, and I think Andrew and a lot of his peers could attest to this too, you have a ton of focus areas at Apple. Sometimes your main one is unblock your engineers so they can build the things they need to build, right? Remove roadblocks. But you have producer teams on different groups. You have different stakeholders, whether it's release engineering, product engineering. Maybe someone with the last name Cook might come down and ask you about some site that you don't know about that might be launching. This is all theoretical. I don't know nothing about nothing. Um, so this leaves a lot of space where, you know, there are some gaps. And so for me, the opportunity was to fill the gaps to help my fellow peers self-organize, improve our decision-making, and ensure that we can augment our team efficiently when we hire contractors. And so those areas for me were technical leadership, technical strategy, process improvement, team culture. Um, in fact, one of the first things I did when I took over ownership of our application uh, development stack was kill it because it was built on 55 different packages and a bunch of half-finished ideas that some were great, and we just went standardized on Scala. That one thing, which sounds kind of small, actually improved our morale a lot because we had one consistent way to write APIs. That's all the team wanted to do was their job. Hiring contractors became more efficient because once we went through the process, we, we decided on someone, I was the point of contact for the vendor. I was also their onboarding buddy. That gave me experience on how to bring people in and create a culture that sets people up for success. And in addition to that, yeah, I was able to accomplish the hiring of three senior engineers who were contractors. Um, built a lot of cross-functional and cross-team communication skills. We had to work with front-end teams who had a lot of different needs, but all worked in the same platform. We had other groups who sometimes had competing priorities, but was all on the same platform. We had to be able to work that out, and that gave me a lot of experience there. Um, we also developed and implemented a lot of team center processes. So one of the first things I was super proud of was an RFC process. In fact, that's probably one of the most things, the one of the things I'm most proud of there because we figured out a way to actually create a system that we all believed in to simply record our decisions. But then when someone challenged it, we could always say, hey, well, here's the decision, here's why, here's the history on it, make a comment or propose something new. It also made it a lot less friction and a lot less argumentative because people knew, hey, if you want to change something, suggest it, figure it out. Let's talk about it. 
Uh, I also led our architecture review and all of our code reviews. That was a bit much, but you know, that was the way the team operated then. And also we were able to improve team engineering culture and morale, especially with my friend, who is my co-lead, who I used to call my desk buddy, very endearingly. Um, he and I were able to set a great tone. I think it's also because he and I had such a great relationship. Um, I'm not saying that your peers, you have to go to the gym with them and you have to go eat Mexican with them and you have to let their dog fart in your face once in a blue, but the relationships and the way you model how you deal with your colleagues will definitely positively impact or sometimes negatively impact your team. Um, that was the most professional way I could say it, sorry. It's real life. But this is the biggest important part. It was that friction in the opportunity I saw that made me decide I wanted to be a manager because I realized that my greatest joy came from removing roadblocks. It didn't come from having my name in lights on projects I built. And I also pretty much built the entire backend for the 30th anniversary of Mac website. I really hope Apple doesn't come after me for saying that. But that was a great kind of achievement in my, in, in my engineering career. I had never been given a project before where they said, hey, 50,000 requests a second should be the norm. Uh, what? But removing roadblocks and seeing people actually be happy to come to the office and actually feel like they can do their job made all the world to me. And that's where I found my why. So the last piece we'll talk about in this area here uh, is company initiatives and groups. And what I mean by that is uh, some informal groups where people self-select, uh, you know, self-organize, and also more formal groups like employee resource groups, where people gather around either by identity or by surface area or by specific uh, in interest. So here's the scenario from my experience we'll talk about here. This is Pandora, one of my favorite places ever to work. Uh, I don't think I've ever been shy about that. Um, I'm still good friends with most of the people there that either work there now or have worked there. We always, you know, it, it's, it was a great time. And one of the biggest things there that helped me prepare for becoming a manager was this opportunity for me to be on our uh, employee resource group for employees of color called Mixtape. I thought that was a cool name, Mixtape, people of color, get it? Um, but that steering committee was made up of directors, managers, the, uh, our sponsoring manager from, from leadership was the head of product and engineering we had, we had people from engineering, sales, analytics, compensation, HR, brand, design, legal, across New York, San Francisco, LA, Chicago. That group for me was the nexus point of my network across all offices. That also meant I was now in a highly visible position. Talking about in the, the, the importance of influence as a manager, visibility is a part of that, whether you're in the same space or you're in the same rooms virtually. And so my role as part of the team focused on our external partnerships and volunteer opportunities. Now, for me, I love this because at the time I was working with Code 2040. So every time we pulled in some Code 2040 mentors, I just pumped them up. I was like, hey, I got the homies here, right? Uh, I got to work with community organizations that were in Oakland. Um, Pandora is, is still to this day a very proud organization that does work in its, in its surrounding communities. So that was pretty awesome. It also meant that I kind of, in a way, was a face of the company, right? You always are a face of the company, no matter where you are. Um, but in particular, I was going out and representing this group. Um, so my opportunity here really focused on partnering with brand, HR, and DEI, in terms of telling our company story, partnering with our social good team on engaging community schools, partners, organizations, um, aligning potential and actual events that we did with our company ideals and values. I had to make sure that if a partner came up to us, it wasn't gonna be like, hey, we want you to do something that totally goes against how you represent yourselves as, as, uh, as pandas, as Pandora folks call themselves, right? I had to make sure that we were aligned. I also had to make sure it was a smart thing for us to invest our time in and make sure that the committee had enough info to say yay or nay. And so the growth areas here were numerous. Um, I mean, I don't know how many commas in there, but it's probably as many commas as there are words in this entire deck. But simply put, while yes, there are challenges with being in an employee research group in terms of being officially recognized, depending on your company culture, the experience you get in all of these various areas can be priceless. Um, and for me, that showed up in a number of ways. The first was 
I've probably had a hand in executing, I don't know, I, I'd probably guess two dozen events in less than two years, um, where we, whether we read to school children on different months celebrating their heritage, whether we invited outside speakers to come in and talk about the importance of music and community, whether we brought people in and talked about the hard conversations that each of our communities of color faced, um, well, it was also putting on events that celebrated our diversity, right? Um, we, I was able to strengthen a lot of areas of my project planning execution. Um, and a lot of my work on this ERG also helped me become a better tech lead on a team where I was leading initiatives and pseudo managing people. We'll talk about the pseudo part a little bit. Um, also built a lot of visibility. I was able to actually crack jokes with the VP of engineering um, because he was also a sponsor of, of one of our groups, right? Um, that kind of informal nature also made it easier when we had some have some hard conversations for me to have some credibility based on a work I did that impacted a lot of our global employees as well as our office, but also uh, show that I did have a history of success here. Um, but most importantly, because I had directors and managers and people of various levels on that team, it gave me a really deep vision of what it means to be an empathetic leader. I had to be of service to people and communities and, and folks who had identities that I don't hold myself. And that is a very important skill to do as a manager because being a manager is not about you. Let me just put that out there. The paycheck's all about you. You make sure you get your money. Don't shy away from conversation. Make sure that's one of your whys. It doesn't have to be your main why. Make sure getting paid is one of your whys. You do a job, they're offering you money for it. You get your money. Um, but understanding and getting influence from so many valuable aspects of leadership was super, super helpful for me in terms of how I modeled myself and how I moved in my career. Um, I also was able to be directly and indirectly mentored by so many people. I got to watch their moves in their actual practices. I got to see how people were managers of sales having to do things I didn't have the pressure of doing. Like I didn't have, I wasn't on the hook for eight figures of ad sales. I just had to make sure the site didn't go down. Sure, I almost took down the website my third week, but we're not gonna talk about that. We're talking about management, not code. I told y'all, I don't write code on Criminal Path no more. Um, but I, I really can't overstate it enough that whether it's an ERG or it's an employee interest group, or it's like an architecture group across teams, there are all these opportunities where people self-organize or maybe organize because of leadership that give you an opportunity to grow and change in ways that you don't expect. And wow, every sense management role. Yeah, Jason, you didn't check the slide, did you? Every management role since. We're just gonna act like that word since is the fourth word, okay? Um, also, I don't know, I, I, I don't know if y'all noticed this, but I do point out my own mistakes because we're all imperfect and I love it. Um, but every management role since I've had has been influenced by this particular experience. I learned how not to be nervous in front of sea levels. I also learned when to shut up and take advice from people who are like, I'm not offering this to you. I'm not asking you if you want it. I'm telling you, calm down, do it a little differently. I also understood a lot more exactly what I wanted to be as a manager. And my next role, I became a manager. Now, it wasn't at Pandora, but as you can see, I still talk about it glowingly. There was no bitterness there. Sometimes you have to move on to get your next role, and that is A-OK. -okay. Pandora also influenced me in a way of how I influence people who move on from any team I've been on, in that you celebrate your alum, right? I was, you know, it was bittersweet for me, even though I was excited. Some folks were probably sad, but also kind of like, all right, well, I mean, you know, <laughs> we don't have to hear about what new sneakers you bought. But we were able to kind of create that space of, success, uh, of celebration. And to this day, we all, there's quite a few of us who all still talk. So other opportunities we can talk about, and I, I've got about maybe five more slides, so it should be wrapping up soon, and we'll have some uh, room for conversation. Um, so other opportunities in the workplace, subject matter expertise. I also drove accessibility and other items when I was at Pandora. Very important skill helped me to help develop empathy for advertising and other teams to understand what they go through as I was training them on how to adopt accessibility into their areas of practice. Very important skill as a manager. Uh, onboarding teams during reorganization. I was pretty much their de facto manager as they were learning about this whole new code base. Uh, 
on adopting them to our practice of how we did Scrum, how we managed our projects, how we did our releases, uh, developing cross team practice groups, uh, creating front end groups that span across multiple teams so you all can speak the same language and, and support each other. Uh, and that's something I probably had a hand in, even as a manager at multiple, almost every place I've been at since Apple. And there's so many other ways, right? Like I said, this isn't a definitive list. I just wanted to give you a couple of examples that I could talk to in my experience. Lastly, we'll talk about mentorship, coaching, and continuous learning. So mentorship and coaching, essential. Find you a mentor, former managers, current managers, managers on the groups, Andrew. You, you, if you find leaders, whether they're directly or indirectly in your sphere, look at them, see what they do, see what they do publicly. And if you find ways to create connection with them, find out a little more privately. Uh, organizations of multi-level mentorship and peer level groups, uh, organizations where people of different levels mentor others, uh, mentorship programs, and also group level coaching, even individual coaching. All of these things should be, or be eventually in your tool belt to become a better manager and leader. And also taking time to learn, to figure out how best you learn. Because as a manager, you're gonna help people figure out how they best learn so that they can get to their growth in the most efficient and impactful manner. Uh, books, audiobooks, paperback, podcasts, you name it, I consume it, right? Um, you know, you can see a lot of the other things here. I've also managed, mentioned again, your managers, managers at previous companies and current companies. Influence is a very important thing, whether it influences for what you wanna do, but also for what you don't wanna do as a manager. And so for me, uh, this is what it looks like. Like I mentioned, I've been a member of Dev Color since 2016. Um, I have in my sphere someone who's on a distinguished fellow track at IBM. I also have someone who's uh, a third year engineer who's getting ready to think about becoming a C engineer and everything in between. It's been an amazing experience. Uh, and then we have that times 60 groups, right, across four cities. Um, I've been teaching boot camps of various times since 2017. If you want to build your, your capacity for empathy and successfully, become an instructor. It also make you a better engineer. Trust me. You become better when you have to tell it back to someone. <laughs> it starts to fill in those gaps that you don't realize you have. Uh, fellowships and also leading through social influence was the first course I created. Uh, I completed at Coursera once I joined earlier this year. Uh, and like I said, I've been a mentor and mentor coach since 2014, off and on with Code 2040. Also for books, I love the 20 minute manager box set because each book literally takes 20 minutes to read and they're also impactful and they're targeted. Project leadership, managing agile with Jira. You probably want that book. Jira is a, mm, can't say that one here. Uh, Twitter, and also remember to di intentionally diversify the sources of your material, right? This part, I will take a couple of seconds and just mention some names. I've been fortunate to really be influenced by a ton of people on Twitter directly and indirectly the Marco Rogers of the world, the Jason Wands of the world, the Tia Caldwells, the Nick Caldwells, the Myra Benjamins of the world, who I was also fortunate to learn from while I was at Pandora as well. Scott Hanselman, who's probably like everybody's uncle, uh, you know, Microsoft-y, uh, Rukmini Reddy, so many more names. It doesn't matter if they have 5 million followers or five, find people that, that you gravitate towards and you feel like are impactful to you and consume and make sure they don't all look like you. That diversity helps you build that empathy for diverse teams and for understanding of this viewpoints that will help you grow as a manager because you don't know it all, you don't see it all. All you have is your worldview. The wider your worldview, the better you become. Sort of road ahead. Uh, first, start back with those questions. Ask yourself those questions, figure out your why. From there, start to look at the opportunities that may or may not present themselves, whether it's at your current company or your future company. And remember that even though I sit here and I talk about these things because I've done these things, I still do these things. It is a road ahead. This is a continuous journey. And so long as you remember your why and it's serving your purpose and you feel fulfilled, you can be the best damn manager you wanna be. And I appreciate you all for listening and hanging out with us tonight. Here's my stats. Um, my website, I told you I don't write code on a critical path. It works, first time in like forever, but mm, I haven't updated in a while. Uh, got my Twitters and my Twitch. Feel free to come through if you want, like and subscribe. But we can now open the floor for questions. Andrew, I don't know how we want to handle that, but again, I appreciate you all. It is a privilege for me to speak to you. Thank you. That was that was awesome, Jason. What I loved most about that is that was like a masterclass in how to tell your story. 
as you go through your career because you got scenarios, you got it all broken down in terms of like, here's the thing I did, here's what I learned, here were the outcomes. I mean, if everybody, if people could just take their experience, whatever their experience is and present it that way, that's, I mean, that, anyway, that, that was worth the price of admission. Um, Appreciate that. I see there's like a ton of chat. I am so sorry I didn't get the chat. Oh, no, no, um, that's all good. But yeah, but we should scroll all the way back to the top and start looking for questions because um, I've lost track of them at this point. But there were a lot of really good questions in there. Let's see. Uh, yeah, so oh. would now be a good time to hop in? Oh, uh, yeah. Cool. Um, so I was just thinking about this. I, I did uh, a bunch of interviews kind of back in the fall when I decided to transition to a new uh, career. And uh, you know, I was interviewing for a senior engineer position. I'm not sure what I said in the interview process that triggered this, but at some point they sent me, uh, you know, an email and just said, hey, stuff sounding good. We just want to be clear that you are not applying for a leadership position. Um, and I think what they meant was, we don't, you're not going to be a manager, you're going to write code. Um, but I thought it was odd, especially considering that I was going to go ahead and be a senior position, which sort of has implications, right? I mean, how would you respond? bond to that and more how would you sort of clarify the difference because i think that was important for me to, to write set in my mind that i'm kind of going to go in and be a leader anyway you know, like you said that but i mean like to people who are clearly you you were doing leadership stuff before you became a manager so how would you you know kind of frame that for someone who might get that response and not react correctly because I, I thought that was you know, that's a you great know. question um so there's two parts there i think if i'm hearing you correctly there's one if you're going for a role that has senior in the name, does that imply like corporate leadership or like leadership as in terms of team membership? And two, um, how do you go about that differentiation in terms of being a leader and showing leadership in your current role? Uh, so the way I would look at it is like this. Um, you can be a player who can, has great court vision in any sport you see. At some point, the coach is going to say, hold on, you're not one of the coaches yet, right? And that's fine. But we always say that the quarterback in football is the coach on the field, right? Like they, they're directing their plays, they're creating the plays. I think one piece there in terms of being a senior engineer is that senior engineer in most ladders today is the decision fork in the road, where the next level is usually some form of actual kind of um, leadership team, where um, you're not just showing leadership in your role or in your, uh, in your projects in your day to day, but you're considered part of the leadership group. Uh, excuse me. And usually that is either at some places tech lead as a manager. I'm not going to tell my philosophy there. It's not about me. Um, or it's technical leadership as like a staff engineer or as a senior staff engineer or even going into um, architect or, or principal. And the way I look at that in terms of leadership, the role in leadership, the team is this. You don't need a specific group membership to be a leader in any context. Right? You can lead, you can help, you can create growth. But there are still stratifications for types of leadership. So for instance, in my current role, I am part of the engineering leadership group, right? I am not part of the executive leadership group. So there's my group, then there's like senior leadership, which is director and above, and then there's executive leadership, which are the two levels. Some might look at that and say, why the crazy pyramid? You have to remember also, as you go up that pyramid, <laughs> there's a lot more information and a lot less freedom. I can probably still, you know, at some point theoretically make some decisions that don't impact my job the same way it might impact someone who's a C-level and has a fiduciary duty as an executive leader of their company. Um, so I think in that question uh, with the interviewer, not knowing what, you know, what, what could have been said, I think one thing there is to clarify is like, well, if I'm, you know, if, if you're talking about leadership quality saying, well, I'm talking about the role and I do have aspirations to be a manager and be in leadership, but I also know what I'm signing up for today, like I'm writing code. Um, that can get challenging in some places because in some places managers still write code. And it's going away, but it hasn't completely gone away. I don't personally agree with it. I think tech lead and beyond, if you're a tech lead or a team lead, there should be some distinction. I think managing and writing code is two <laughs> different contexts and it's really hard to do both very, very well. Um, but yeah, I think that said, if I've answered your question, I think you can think about that leadership part of being like, hey, I understand as a senior engineer, I am a senior member and a leader in an individual contributor space, not in a management and leadership space. And I'm 
going and I want to grow into a management and leadership space in that group next. Does that help out? It does. Thank you. Again, I, just, I wanted to hear your perspective and I got it. Appreciate you. Sweet. Um, yeah, I am looking for that setting where you can copy and paste your question, but um, each person who has a question, just if you put a next in the chat, we'll, we'll create a queue. You can go back up, maybe scroll up and read your question if you want to, or ask it in a different way. But uh, <laughs> so you also said, do people still call themselves webmasters? Not really. Um, that first assistant webmaster role was also back in like 2002. Um, I'm aging myself a bit, but <laughs> you know, um, I'm going to share my screen again real quick because I love my emotes. Um, that gray patch is real. It, it's a thing. So there it is. Uh, you know. Just saying, I'm on brand. <laughs> uh, let's Stacey. see. Stacey, you have a question? I do, but it's not really my question. It's Tanya's question um, that I wanted to make sure it got answered because I was like plus one million to this, even though I think I did the wrong number of zeros. Um, do you think, Jason, in your career, there were ever times where you worked overtime and it benefited you in a way that if you hadn't done that, you wouldn't have done as well as if you had worked normal hours? Uh, I will say there's a lot of nuance there, and yes. Um, first, I think overtime and crunch time are two different things. If you're in a world of perpetual crunch and perpetual overtime, even though those are two different things, I think there is something indicative of improvements being need to be met. Um, there are some people who choose to put in a few extra hours because they have the space or they're curious and they want to grow. As long as that's not the expected extension of your workday and you are given the space to choose that, that's your choice. I won't always recommend it. I will say that you have to make sure to uh, give yourself the space to also relax. But there are times where, you know, I, I will say some of the overtime I put in when I was at Apple, for instance, definitely helped me scale up in some ways that maybe might have taken me a bit longer. There was also some crunch time at Apple and other places that probably didn't teach me anything, but that I need sleep. Um, and I think that's the other positive <clears throat> aspect about putting in long hours is also figure out where your boundaries are. You know, when do you need to step away? Um, and then there's also, you know, when I was DJing while uh, in my New York years, so a, a different type of overtime. I was also learning how to negotiate my rates and, and, and conduct business on a whole different scale, but also time management and create boundaries for myself. Uh, so that my overtime, because I was a contractor then as well, didn't bleed into my personal time where I wanted to DJ and figure out how to be like the next super mega producer. Clearly, I succeeded at that. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't see the platinum plaques on my wall. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I hope that answers your question. But yeah, I mean, sometimes you can make it work for you, right? Uh, if it's in service to you and it's not a constant requirement or it's a requirement that was stated up front and you're okay with it, then sure. And it has been for me, yes. Good question. Tanya, I feel like I'm, I'm expecting more nexts in the chat from you. You had a lot of questions, they were good ones. I think most of it was just commentary, wasn't it? Oh, I don't <laughs> know. So much questions. Um, I was just yeah, scrolling back too. Yeah, yeah. Uh, successful sh shipping of a product up that provides value note for question time, interested in specific ways this can be achieved, an engineering manager's relationship with product managers or pro project managers who also have a say in the team's delivery. Oh yeah, the, I guess the relationship. So if you're an engineering manager, um, there's obviously like a, a relationship, it's a bit of a push and pull relationship between product owners and project managers um, and how to manage that. Because if it's part of your job to make sure your team is shipping High quality software, a large part of that is, you know, are they being asked to build the right thing in the right time frame? Yeah, I think one of the biggest parts about that, I see it as there's either a triangle or a cube of tension. And usually it's a triangle between product engineering and design, or product engineering design and a stakeholder, depending on the, the, the makeup of your organization. But in the middle of that tension, usually is the right answer. And so I think for me, it's become important for me in my career to understand that I'm not paid to always be 100% correct and always have the answer. But I am empowered to say things that help us get there. 
right? And so managing that relationship is really understanding that if you have healthy tension there, and I'm, I don't mean tension as in y'all look at each other and you're like, yo, we about to do 10 rounds of Street Fighter Five as soon as we get off work. So I can like give you a couple uppercuts because I don't want to hit you in real life. But I mean, tension as in like, hey, there's this push pull, what's the right thing to do? And if y'all have a shared culture and understanding, usually in the middle of that tension is the right thing. And usually in the middle of that is meeting your OKRs, everyone getting a bonus or whatever extra compensation you get. And ultimately a happy and success, a, a happy customer and a successful initiative. Um, so yeah, Tanya, I think that's an important thing you called out there that there should be that tension. Um, no one's ever gonna 100% agree with something you do. And when you do take on some of the project parts, it's not about you taking their job. For me, it's been a lot about developing the empathy for what they have to go through. So I don't have to do it forever, right? Like I will do aspects of it, but it's not my job. <laughs> I, got, I got a team to take care of. Cool, thank you. Yeah, Eddie so had a, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. I was gonna say Eddie had a question about um, dealing with imposter syndrome as a manager. So, so sometimes I don't know if I'm making the right decisions for, for me or maybe there could be someone better. Yeah, um, first off, just it's real. Imposter syndrome affects us all. Um, I've definitely had moments even in my current role and I've appreciated that my manager has been able to pick up at times or like understand like when I'm, maybe I'm like, eh, it's like, no, 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 you're on the right path, keep going. Um, you know, a lot of us have different ways of where we need that confirmation that we're at least on the right journey and the right path. Some it's, you know, in a social sense, some people call it the five love languages, right? In a work sense, it's just called, you know, positive signals for building engaging culture. Um, wow, I gotta write that book. Um, <laughs> But more importantly, um, I, I think me really trying to embrace the notion that I'm not always going to have the right answer or make the 100% correct decision, but that I will build teams and coaches that are resilient so that if we can, if we course correct, we will not have a disaster, we will always learn and we'll continue to grow, that ultimately I'm doing the right thing. Um, everybody is just one person in a very crazy you know, machine of cogs. There's no way for us to control for everything and be able to say well, with 100%, without, without a shadow of doubt that this will always be correct. Um, that's just not, I, I think, the environment that we are in. And so I think the more that you model as a leader, the space and the culture for people to embrace that, sometimes they're going to make a bet that's not going to be the right bet, but the data they learn for it will make them make the right decision next the more you can actually hopefully start to embrace that yourself. Um, and just, you know, I, I think it is important for us to show our teams and to model certain types of behavior uh, and, and belief of that. I'm gonna get it wrong at some point. Look, if you tell me to roll a six with a, pet, with, 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 with a single die a hundred times, I'm never gonna hit a six. That's just my luck. So don't ask me to be right a hundred percent of the time either. Like, you know, you know, I love video games, but I suck at half of them, you know, but as long as I continue to have fun and grow and actually get to doing the right thing, I, I think we can find those ways to push back that imposter syndrome and for us to really stand in the belief that we're getting better and stronger every day. Nice. Um, so he asks, uh, how much do you get involved with traditional management? So strategy, finance, that kind of thing. Uh, I'm sorry, repeat that one more time? Well, as an engineering manager, how much, how often do you get involved with sort of traditional management in the sense of like strategy, finance? Uh, a little bit. It depends. It depends on the environment. It depends on the setup. It depends on uh, cost controls. But every engineering manager has a budget, just like every other type of manager. Um, you don't really want to get in trouble with finance for blowing that budget, uh, especially if you're talking about software um, or you're talking about platforms. Uh, you know, we, we, we send metrics all the time about the cost of our systems. Uh, one thing that managers of that in various companies in various ways are also in, very much in tune with is the cost to acquire talent, aka how many dollars do we spend to get the next engineer that's going to join our team, right? Um, and the way you see people balance that cost if they're not talking about it explicitly in dollars and cents is how do we make our hiring process more efficient? How do we make it more equitable? How do we increase the pipeline? How are we sure we got the best talent no matter where they live? All of those are also speaking to, 
how do we make sure we get the best bang for our buck and we're not just throwing out millions of dollars to get like one candidate who may not be the best person to come here, right? Um, so while most of my day is not thankfully dealing with ledgers and spreadsheets, I do have a quarterly budget. I do have to make sure it's in line. Every year I get a lot of the budget for, uh, for you know, re rewarding the team, whether it's raises and or bonuses. And I find that many companies just have different ways where managers can plug into different formulas to fit into that overall. Um, so I guess that's how I'll answer that question. Thanks. Just going back up, and there are some other questions. We kind of had a little chat about some of the other questions in the chat, but um, uh, Sahil did ask if, uh, you know, if you have to move into management to make more money at some point. No, not as much anymore. So here, here's the thing, and this is why I said finding your why is the most important part of whether you become a manager or not, but also why you should do it annually. More and more, we have gotten back to, especially in software, the notion of a technical or individual contributor leadership track, the staff engineer, the senior staff engineer, the principal engineer, the distinguished fellow. Um, and usually, more often than not, you'll find that those tracks are parallel with management so that a staff engineer is usually parallel to a manager because the biggest differentiator is one is deeply technical and one is gonna be a lot more people driven, right? Technical leaders usually don't have direct reports. They might have managers or people in their org but they are still judged as individual contributors. Um, so, and I would say if you do not want to be a manager, which I hope this talk can also help you figure out for right now or 10 years from now, then it also should help you find opportunities that allow you to grow, get some of these same leadership um, abilities, but put them in a technical context and not have to manage people and still get your money. Look, whether your money is your first reason or your 50th, um, like I said, <laughs> We all exchange services so that we can live the life we live. Make sure, you know, make sure you get what you deserve. And make sure you don't, you're not putting put into a role and you're not putting yourself into a role just for the money and you really don't want to be there. Because if you're if you're doing that as a manager, that will show up in how you manage your team and how you show up for them. And that can have damaging effects. Same with technical leadership. So you can have the freedom and not know what you want to do and be curious and grow into it. But if you know definitively that's not where you want to be, my suggestion, it doesn't have to be taken as truth, is that perhaps you don't do it just to consider the damage that could put on your organization and also harm your relationships with others. Um, yeah, Lyle had a good question uh, about how do you get past the fear of having hard conversations? So, the fear of hard conversations. Um, first, tap into the culture that's in your organization. The better the culture and the better the environment, I find not the easier, but the more accessible the hard conversations become. For me, uh, when I kick off any new relationship as a manager, I try to find out how people like to receive any type of feedback. Um, and I try to honor that with whenever I have to have the hard conversation, right? Whether it's, hey, your performance is not where we expect it to be. Um, I think one of the biggest parts about hard conversations when it comes to performance is making sure you have an objective rubric. If everything you're talking about is purely subjective, you're gonna get challenged on it. And that creates space for the hard conversation to then become adversarial. Because whenever it's too subjective, there's no way someone knows everything that's in your, pref your preference, right? So you have to make sure you, you're, you're, you're having these conversations based on some objective rubric, some objective standard that's also widely held, right? That your team at least holds with you. Um, the second place is to remember that we, we talk about things, but we deal with people with care, right? So if someone does something that was that maybe led to a disappointing result, the result was disappointing, the person is fine. You should never refer to the person as being disappointing. How can they disappoint you? What, what, like, who are you in their lives besides a manager and leader that they would disappoint you? It's not them that disappointed you, it's, in, it's a result of an action, which means there's room for us to understand, learn and grow from that. So I think some of having a hard conversation is also making sure that we're framing it appropriately. 
that we're talking about the object at hand, that we're still honoring the person that, that we're talking to. They are a grown adult, <laughs> right? They, they, they bleed red just like you. They breathe the same oxygen. Uh, they're stuck in the same house you are. We're using the same Zoom and we're on the same internet that Al Gore built in 2000. So as long as we always keep that in, in mind, we can at least frame the conversation from, hey, look, we've built a cultural respect. We've built a mutual relationship. It doesn't mean we have to drink beer together on Fridays at 5 p.m., but it does mean that every time we come into the office, and we speak to each other, good, bad, or indifferent, we know that there is a frame of reference for this relationship that anything we talk about should be able to be talked about. It doesn't mean it's always going to be received nicely. It doesn't mean it gets any easier. But it does mean that when someone looks back and receives that information, they can go, well, I know you're coming at me from a place of respect and that we're talking about this professionally and objectively. So at least when I form my response, I can tell you exactly how I feel as well. Thank you. We got perspective. Yep. Um, we got some some interest in hearing about these objective standards that you that you mentioned. Like what? Uh, just like hearing more, more about that. Like what does that mean? Like when you you know when it comes come into those conversations with something factual, something that's yeah objective. So, um, I, I, I'll I'll frame it in a couple of examples. Um, but usually your objective. Uh, rules should be something that's organization driven and that's shared in understanding, right? So for instance, uh, if someone says the website is slow, that's not objective. Slow versus what? If someone says, hey, you're doing work at a slow pace, you're consistently behind what we expect. What's a slow pace, right? If you're saying you're not meeting the standard for quality and we say that quality means you have documentation, you have unit tests, you have these things, that's objective. But if you come to someone four weeks later and you say, yo, you had like 50 bugs, like you're sloppy. What does sloppy mean? Sloppy is subjective, right? So there, there's no real purely objective definition for sloppy. So you have to make sure that one, you have clear expectations being delivered. Uh, two, that someone has an, a, a, a clear way to meet them that doesn't require on your mood, right? If we say that a service to be a healthy service, for instance, has to respond in 500 milliseconds. That's objective. You can measure it. If it ain't 500 milliseconds, you know that it didn't respond in, in quick enough time. If it measured under 500, you know it did. And then you can measure how often it did that. If it did it less than you're expected to, well, we have an objective way to say here in the data, your service is performing under par. Keyword, your service is performing under par. Not you suck. That's subjective and also just not constructive, and you should never use that language towards another human being, especially in a managerial context. Um, so that's what I mean when I talk about objectiveness. And, and I think you can apply that to anything. What do you expect from someone who's a senior engineer versus a non-senior engineer? What do you expect from a staff engineer versus a senior engineer? What do you expect from a manager than from a tech lead? What do you expect from a VP of engineering rather than a director? All these things, even if there's room for interpretation of certain styles, there should be objective ways you measure what success is. And we should both be able to communicate, measure, and understand what those things are. Well, how do you, so I think that that works for a lot of things. How do you handle the like, oh, you know, that's Stacy, she's really abrasive? Well, I think, <laughs> well, I think we also can apply objectiveness there too. Um, if we have standards for language and we have standards for how we treat people with respect and we say these are our shared values that are listed as an organization. And when we say we communicate honestly, this is what we mean. And this is also explicitly some things that of what we don't mean. You now can make that a little less ambiguous, right? Um, I also think that when it comes to abrasive, right? <laughs> you can also view that as subjective. Right, like um, abrasive as compared to what? Abrasive in what way? And if someone says, well, she's really direct. Okay, well, explain to me what you mean by she's really direct. Well, when we talk about something, she says, hey, well, that service went down and I think we need to fix it. That's not abrasive. She's being direct, the service went down and we need to fix it. It's probably a P0, let's talk about it. Now, if there's something about her tone you don't like, that that goes into subjective realm and that becomes a different conversation. Um, 
if it's y'all had a debate and maybe she used words that made you feel like you were being belittled, well, we can we can objectify that and we can say, hey, well, this doesn't really meet the standards of what we say is our shared values of what professional is. Now, yes, not every single little thing is gonna be written down on paper, but I think if we have shared understanding of what our values are, shared understanding of examples of what we should and should not do, and that we're explicit around the things that we really feel like we need to be explicit about, we should have enough objectiveness to be able to navigate where things might be a little ambiguous. And when we find ambiguity, it's up to us, no matter the title or role we have, to drive for clarity. If we think our, our values around language is ambiguous and there's problems with that, as a leader, we're accountable for cleaning that up, right? We have to make that less ambiguous. We have to make sure that we have a way to say, look, if someone says some of these things, they're clearly violating some of our agreements and, and like case in point, our code of conduct, right? Our code of conduct will tell you very clearly and will give you enough for you to understand in an objective way whether someone's being abrasive or not in chat. And that's what we need to aim for. And for some people who say, oh, well, you know, if you have a good culture, you don't need all that. No, it's not about whether you have a good culture or not. It's about making sure that everyone understands the rules of engagement and that everyone feels empowered to not only improve it, but to point out the good and the not so good examples of that of those values in action. And then again, talk about the actions and the things, not the people. Mm -hmm. I think it's the code that, of conduct is like you're like you're going into business with your best friend. You still you really should have a contract. <laughs> you know, a thousand percent. Um, and even in that example, right? I wouldn't. If someone said, oh, well, Stacey's, Stacey's abrasive, I'm like, well, is she being abrasive? Did she say something abrasive? How is Stacey abrasive? She's not sandpaper. She's not gonna scratch me when she walks by me, right? <laughs> like, but there might be an action she took or some words. So let's actually get to what we're actually talking about, right? And so that it does mean sometimes for us as, as leaders, whether we are managers or senior technical folks or, or not, we have to get to the heart of asking why to understand exactly what someone means when they give a blanket statement like, ah, oh, Stacey's being abrasive, right? And Stacey's a sweetheart. I mean, she's, she's the greatest, she's the greatest. And I will <laughs> say this objectively, Stacey is a very supportive, very, very much promoting, friendly presence in every space I've been in. And Thanks, also Susan. has- Susan, tell my manager that. <laughs> He's calling me abrasive in front of a bunch of people. <laughs> I write performance reviews, 100 bucks each. I'm joking, I'm joking, I'm joking. Don't get me in trouble at work. <laughs> I only use you as an example because I knew you could take it. Stacey. I'm kidding. <laughs> Anything? Uh, yeah. So, no, I so that, oh, I'm sorry. Was somebody ask, about to ask something? Go ahead. I didn't mean to cut you off. Hey, Jason. Um, I had a question about your your role currently at Coursera. Um, how many engineers are you managing right now? And like, what does your day-to-day -day look like for them? Are you doing weekly one-on-ones? Or um, like, what does that look like for your day-to-day? -day? Uh, great question, Kevin. Um, so currently I have 10 direct reports um, of varying levels and a couple of contractors. And so I, as a manager, I try to make sure that I have a cadence with of one-on-ones that best serve my team members. Meaning if, if after a few months, someone and I has a great rapport, they've been fully onboarded, if they want to move to monthly and there's no reason for us to speak as often because maybe we have a lot of touch points with projects we do week to week, I'm fine with that. Um, for some of my more junior team members, we probably meet week to week so that they can get more guidance and mentorship. Um, I would say normally it's bi-weekly. Um, and for each team member, we have quarterly reviews. Uh, we have an annual review process. And at the end of that review process, going back to objectiveness, uh, we review actually everybody, we, everyone, uh, I have a one-on-one -on -one with everyone where we go through uh, our rubric for where you are at your current level, where you wanna go next. And then we actually create on paper, yes, for each of my 10 engineers, we have a development plan. And they're not only accountable to it, so am I. And I sign my name at the bottom. Does this officially go to HR? No. But for me and that person, and it goes into our actually public document folder, um, and if they choose to make it private, they can. Um, it helps keep me honest and accountable to my team that I have been committing to and putting them and finding opportunities 
for the things that we said they need to take advantage of. For instance, I can't uh, suggest someone take leadership training and then not find a way to make leadership training available to them for an entire year. That's, that's on me, that's not on them, right? Especially if I say it's gonna happen internally. So those are some of the ways that I kind of manage that. And in terms of my day to day, um, so, you know, I have some status calls with a couple of different folks. I, I think the very first thing I do is I check JIRA. Um, me, Jerry and I have a, a, a very, uh, functional relationship, I'll call it. Um, functional as in, I just look at everything that's assigned to me and I just try to figure out what board it's from and I figure out who you should go to from there. Um, I check our metrics and look at our health, the health of our systems just to ensure that we're meeting our service le level agreements. Um, I will probably have my first couple of meetings of the day, usually with someone, uh, my, my product uh, manager, or sometimes my, my direct manager, who's a senior director of engineering. Um, then we'll have stand up right before we go to lunch. And then I'll have my one-on-ones in the afternoon. I prefer to have one-on-ones in the afternoon. I feel like it gives me a better frame of mind in terms of context. I like to have my other meetings in the morning. Even though I'm not a morning person, I feel like it forces me to just be alert. Because if I, if the thing I don't like is me saying I'm not a morning person and then I have one-on-ones and I'm not paying attention, that's just me being a piss poor manager in my opinion. So instead I have meetings where I am forced to pay attention and to be engaged because I will be awake and I will be there. And then by lunch, I'm 100% good for the afternoon. And then we could dive in and talk about all the good, hard, easy things that we need to talk about performance wise. Um, on a weekly cadence, I either have a planning meeting for the sprint or a team meeting. And then every week at 4 p.m., my team has a, uh, a game hour and it can be anything. We play board games online, we play, uh, we played Among Us. Uh, one of my team members is a little too good at killing all of us. Uh, kind of scares me a bit. Um, and yeah, so that's like a typical week. And then usually around once a week, I'll have a group uh, lunch with other engineering managers across the engineering org. Um, like I said, I have my one-on-one -on -one with my direct manager. I have a one-on-one -on -one with other managers as well. Um, also I have one-on-one -on -one with our staff technical uh, project manager. Um, who's pretty much like our senior most practice lead when it comes to managing projects. Uh, so I do have lots of one-on-ones. I, I think half of my week is building individual context with people. Um, and then maybe 25% is like project-based and the other 25 is usually me being able to uh, do administrative work and now finding more time to do what my manager calls deep thinking in terms of figuring out where my organization is going to go, um, what path and steps I'm taking to get us there, what systems we need to own, what systems we shouldn't own, all those things I need to block out time and just think about. And that's pretty much a given week. Cool, thanks. Because I was just curious, um, as a short follow-up, let me actually turn my video on so I can actually say hi to you. Hey, hey, this time. Kevin! Hey, yeah, what's going on? Um, I feel like I'm treadmill buddies of Stacy. I'm walking at a gym right now. Um, good to see you, Jason. Um, yeah, man. The, yeah. Um, I was going to ask, because it, so it sounds like you don't do too much code review or, or coding, right? And I know it's different between every organization, but yep. right now you're pretty 0% on, on actual coding or code review. Yeah, so I, I spend a lot more time in those individual meetings on strategy, uh, like ownership, um, metrics, health checks, um, standards development. I I may look at a PR every now and then, and it's mostly just for my own, like just under, continue to understand what we own and what we have out there. Um, I empower my team to trust each other for the day-to-day -day and for some of those things. Um, I also empower my team to tell me what's the most important, like what's the smart thing to do in some situations. So like when it came, for instance, for our code review process, I made suggestions based on past places I've been, and they took some reference from that, but came up with their own solution, implemented it, and now we've got a much more efficient PR process. So it didn't have to come from me directly. Um, and also I split some of that day-to-day -day work with our, with our work stream lead. Uh, in particular, our work stream lead like runs our standups and is basically in charge of the day-to-day. -day. Like, hey, are there blockers? Should we talk about this in parking lot? Uh, do we need to escalate the J? Do we need to pull them in, get some advice? Um, but I kind of try to keep 
my involvement in technical conversations to strategy, ownership, uh, larger scale quality, and commit by commit, just let the team rock out. Uh, I, I do think that, especially at this juncture, the biggest impact I can have on each of my engineer, engineers uh, careers and, and tenures is not reviewing their code. It's probably reviewing the things they're doing on the way to writing that code. Also, Paris, see you, bro. Appreciate you coming through, Def Color. Also, I just want to let the record reflect. Paris shouted out the uh, asterisk in chat. Yeah. So, uh, uh, yeah, and uh, Kevin actually uh, uh, is one of my esteemed partners in the classroom. Uh, we we worked together when we uh, taught uh, at uh, University of Denver. Nice. Super cool. There's there are so many good questions, and I feel like if we answer them all, we could be here for hours. Um, I don't know if there's another way to continue the conversation. Like uh, if people want to maybe post some questions on Meetup, um, Jay, would you be up for yep. Look, just having uh, some conversations on there? Definitely. Um, we could also like, you know, find an opportunity to kind of continue the conversation. I'm not really trying to plug my Twitch, but I'll just plug it here. Mostly because <laughs> last night we actually did have a long talk about burnout and how we manage that as we move up the path. So I'm one of those, science and technology streamers where I'm writing code on the screen, but I'm like 10% code, 90% talking and just engaging with chat. Um, but definitely feel free to shout me out on Twitter and just like, yo, Jay, I want to ask you this question. We can talk on Twitter all day. Um, we can talk and, and I'll definitely follow up on the meetup as well. Um, you know, I like I said, I'll make sure we share the slides out so you can pull, um, you can, you know, pull whatever ways you want to reach me there. Um, and ultimately, you know, again, I appreciate you all for the questions. I appreciate the engagement. I learned a lot even from the questions you asked because that gives me a lot of new types of perspective of like, oh, wow, I haven't considered that, <laughs> right? Like this is, this is how we all grow. Um, and I'm always happy to talk shop. I can run my mouth all day, which is probably why Andrew's also like, let's move it along because Jason will literally sit here all night. <laughs> um, but yeah, I appreciate you all. Andrew, definitely appreciate you giving me the opportunity to chat here. Stacy, you're oh, yeah. justice. <laughs> um, and whether you want to be a manager or not, just understand that in every role we play, whether it's our first or our 50th development role, uh, we're all leaders. We all find ways to influence. We all find ways to grow. And we always, we all find ways to help other people grow. Um, just always ask yourself, what's your why? Are you being fulfilled? And are those things still serving you? That can be a really good North Star for how you go from there. Love it. We'll wrap there. Thanks so much. This is amazing. Great job. Thank you everybody for coming. Um, we'll be back in two weeks with uh, lightning talks. So if anybody here is interested in presenting a little 10 or 15 minute uh, thing at the next, the next tech talk, let us know. Thanks so much, everybody. Have a good night. Thanks everybody. Thanks Jason. Bye everyone. See you later.